It's 1960s in Japan. Japan has largely recovered from the devastation of World War II. The Tokyo Olympics are in 1964, so that gives you an idea of how modern the, the Japanese economy had gotten, society, um, the fact that there was now you know, infrastructure to host many, many people internationally. So um, the dark days of the war are essentially past, and there are now opportunities. And a young man named Osamu Tezuka decides to uh, take hold of those opportunities, especially in the new medium of television. Television was a, an increasingly big deal in Japan, although actually not many people could afford a television yet. They'd actually go down to the street corner to like a, a TV store and watch TV there. Um, but it was really, really big. So Tezuka got in it into his head to adapt his own uh, most successful manga creation as a weekly half-hour animated TV series. This had never been done before. There was certainly animation on TV, but they were either short episodes, you know, three or five minutes long, or they were segments of an, of an uh, existing TV series. But Tezuka brought Astro Boy to television in 1963. And this was important for a couple of reasons. One is that, as we all know, anime has very much been driven by you know, TV series ever since. There are certainly movies and OVAs and such, but TV has become essentially the primary medium for anime. And Astro Boy is the first one of those. Also, um, Tezuka still didn't quite have enough money. Animation is very expensive. So he actually sold Astro Boy for half what it cost to make and made up the rest through merchandising deals. That would be a big thing moving forward, which you get to later. Um, but secondly, he didn't quite realize how much time you needed to make an anime series. He figured you just produce 24 minutes of animation every week, which is not how it works. So his animators were working under an intense time pressure and a time crunch. They could not animate the way Disney did. So instead, they looked towards a uh, method of animation called limited animation. What limited animation does is essentially says, animate only what is absolutely necessary to get across the story. Now, some people see limited animation as purely a budgetary constraint, i.e. you only do limited animation when you are cheap and don't have the money to do Disney animation. That's not exactly true. Limited animation can be a legitimate animation choice and, in a sense, a response to the Disney approach. Disney has essentially made a lot of people think that the Disney animation style is the correct way of animating. And limited animation, uh, for some animators, was seen as kind of a direct reaction against that to say, no, it doesn't have to be that way. But limited animation is also budget conscious. So instead of having constant character movement, if there's a dialogue scene, the characters are static while you have, the, you have those lip flaps, right? And if a character, you know, is running, you might reuse that running cycle over and over again throughout the course of your animated series. So we see limited animation in Astro Boy, but, and a very big but, Osamu Tezuka and his artists were artists. They cared. They didn't want to make Astro Boy look and feel cheap. So they looked for ways to adapt the limited animation style to increase the power of the animation. So they did things like really focus down on the actual imagery being drawn to make sure that those images had as much dramatic power as possible. So instead of just drawing a character with sort of a neutral expression having a conversation, they made sure that those expressions got across the character's actual emotional state. They heightened the drama within the drawings themselves, so even if they weren't moving, they got across a lot. They also started playing around a lot with the imagery that you see in those images. So if you've ever seen an anime, sweat drops, throbbing forehead veins, nosebleeds, uh, you don't see exactly that stuff in Astro Boy, but you see the beginnings of those things start to appear in Astro Boy. Those are a way of encoding emotions and other information through relatively simple imagery. So you don't have to add long dialogue scenes or complex animation to get, get across those things. They also started playing around with subjective time. 
Because the animators are in complete control of what's on screen, you can speed up time, slow down time. If you've ever seen a shonen series where um, people are punching each other and for some reason a fight that really should only take maybe 30 seconds in real life is happening over the case over the course of like 10 minutes because you know we zoom in on somebody punching somebody and we see their reaction time slows down and speeds up that subjective time and we see them really playing around with that in Astro Boy on the flip side of that they try to make sure that the audio the sound effects in Astro Boy were as realistic as possible. Why would you do that, you might ask? Well, because in a, the moving picture medium, you have the moving pictures and you have sound. If the sound is realistic, that helps sell what you're seeing. If the audio doesn't match the video, it doesn't seem quite right. If you're using constant goofy Hanna-Barbera sound effects and slide whistles and so forth, it will feel cheap and cartoony. But if things have weight, if you know rockets sound like rockets, and if footfalls sound like real footfalls, it brings you in and helps to kind of offset the relatively limited animation to draw you into the story. And to prove this, in a way, I want you to think back to all the anime you've seen and think about how often you've heard goofy, cartoony sound effects. You probably can't think of any. There are very few anime that ever have done this because, again, it's a way of selling it because you can't have constant movement all the time. That really draws you in. Then the final big thing, and there were some other elements as well, was this merchandising aspect where Astro Boy products were everywhere. And this really helped to sell Astro Boy um, to the average audience. Now, the average kid absolutely knew who Astro Boy was, but it did a really um, important job in allowing for a broader, richer experience around Astro Boy. In other words, you get into Astro Boy through the manga or the anime or stickers or what have you. There were tons of different inroads into this franchise suddenly, and they were not all dependent on the original manga or on the anime. And this worked. This worked stupendously well. Depending on who you ask, about a third of all Japanese households that owned televisions tuned in to watch Astro Boy every single week. That's the kind of ratings that like the last episode of Seinfeld or Friends gets, not regular episodes. And because it was successful, lots of other people decided to copy it. So the story of the 1960s is really the story of animation and anime as a distinct artistic style and a di distinct approach to animation beginning to really flower. And we start to see many of the genres that we're comfortable with um, appear during this decade. And so you see... Um, the same year as Astro Boy, a little while later, we got Gigantor, Tetrigen 28 Go, the first mecha series, giant robot series. And so we see mecha um, grow out of that. Um, a few years later, we got Sally the Witch and The Secret of Akko-chan, the first uh, shoujo girl series and first magical girl anime series. It's actually complicated which one is which because the manga for one came out before the anime of the other and it's whatever. Um, but you definitely see anime aimed at girls and anime with the, um, the tropes of magical girl that we're all used to. You know, she has a magical compact and allows her to transform and all that kind of stuff in Akko-chan. Uh, later in the decade, we also got Gegege no Kitaro, the first horror anime. Uh, and now when I say horror, it should be pointed out. The anime of the 60s and before were all aimed at children, like preteen children grade school. Um, you will hear people occasionally claim that anime is this mature, dark, sophisticated medium and always has been. It has not. Anime was for kids when it first started out too. Um, so when I say horror, it's a supernatural investigation series. Uh, but there are horrific things that happen and you know, dark stuff that happens, people getting kidnapped and so forth and so on. It is, it is horror. It's just kind of kitty horror in a way, but it, it is definitely there. Uh, we also got Star of the Giants, the first big baseball and sports anime. 
And so thus we get the you know every year we get several sports series and usually at least one baseball anime every single year goes back to 1968's Star of the Giants. Um, so I want you to imagine being an animator at this point in anime history. You're no longer an individual animator working at home. You're now a member of a studio, maybe 10 to 20 people all working on whatever is the anime you're working on. The series back then were long, 50 episodes minimum. Uh, so you were generally working on a new series maybe every year, maybe longer which meant that you were probably um, going from you know, an adaptation of a children's book one year to a shoujo series the next year to a boy's adventure series the next year. You weren't really specializing yet. You were getting whatever, you know, whatever work you could that way. Um, but you now have an actual company you're working for that is bringing in income you know, regularly pretty much. Now, budgets are still very, very low. You are probably struggling to make rent off what you're making in animation. Uh, it, is, it is, you know, because of Tezuka and that merchandising, budgets are extremely low, and you can see that in the animation of the anime of the 60s, and kind of all the way through in, in a lot of cases. But at least an industry is now formed. And unfortunately, all of that and what would seem like all of Japanese society was about to change with the student riots of the late 60s and early 70s. But that's the next video.